Hello, everybody, and welcome to um, the webinar, Motivational Interviewing for Smoking Cessation, Part 2. We are happy to have you all on board. Um, and we're just going to go through a couple housekeeping. Um, first of all, this webinar will be recorded. Um, the recording and the PowerPoint slides will be available on the Great Lakes PTTC website in a couple of weeks. This webinar does not include um, CEUs. Today's format um, will be that the audio will be broadcast through your computer speakers, so please make sure they're turned on and up. There will be no call-in number available, and if you have questions, please use the chat um, feature below to ask questions during the webinar, um, and at the end, we will have a Q&A session. So once again, we are lucky enough to have Laura Saunders as our presenter, so um, I am going to turn it over to her. Thank you, Laura. All right. All right. Thanks, Anne. Um, hello, everybody. Can you, can you hear me? Anne, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. All right, good. So today we are going to pick up where we left off last week. So last week we got a good start into learning, hopefully we, you got a good start, uh, learning a little bit about motivational interviewing and what it is. So those first three things in green were pretty much what we covered last week. We talked about uh, the key concepts in motivational interviewing. We talked about the concept of um, ambivalence and how it's normal to be ambivalent. We talked about um, what motivational interviewing really is. And we talked about those four processes of engaging, focusing, evoking, and planning, and how each of those contributes to promoting change. We talked about how engaging is the who. Who are you? What, what's up with you? I really want to get to know you. And I'm not going to try to fix you right away. Focusing is the process by which we pick what. Which, what topic are we talking about today? Oftentimes, the people that we're working with have lots and lots of things that they could be talking about in terms of behavior change. So focusing helps them and us decide which one of those things is most pertinent in the conversation. Evoking is the third process, and this is the one that's unique to motivational interviewing because what we're evoking is we're evoking change talk. We're helping the person, uh, we're facilitating their uh, expression of change talk, helping them say what about this particular change is important to them. Why on earth would they want to make this change? And then planning is the process by which we do how. How should we fix this problem? So engaging is the who, focusing is the what, evoking is the why, and planning is the how. We talked last week about how it's really easy for well-meaning practitioners to find out who somebody is and what's troubling them, picking the topic of what's troubling them, and then immediately moving into the how. And when we do that, uh, it, what happens is, is that the change is less likely to stick. So we're going to, uh, this week, we're going to continue to work on how do we make ourselves better equipped to spend time in that why area. And then we just did some stuff with the or skills a little bit last week around that in, uh, relational foundation. So what we're going to do this week is we're going to develop our OR skills to cultivate change talk. We're going to talk about how do we get more change talk going. We're going to evaluate the usefulness of MI. Hopefully you will have an opportunity to evaluate, to continue to evaluate the usefulness of MI for your practice. And then what we're doing is we're engaging in some kind of an ongoing learning process to begin working towards fidelity. So you can um, start making a plan for what you could do if you want to make MI a big part of your work. So just to get ourselves back in the mood for MI, I want to remind ourselves that no matter what it is that we're practicing in, in motivational learning, as we're learning about skills and we're practicing our skills and honing our skills, we always have in mind the spirit of motivational interviewing. And that spirit of motivational interviewing follows, follows a nice mnemonic, which is PACE, Partnership, Acceptance, Compassion, or Evocation. Again, if you would like to rearrange those and make that a cape that you put on every time you try to do MI, that might be another way for you to remember this. So 
Partnership again, we want to acknowledge that this person is our partner. We're seeking their collaboration. We're emphasizing autonomy, reminding this person, this is your choice. We're always accepting of the person that we're working with. We're showing absolute worth. We are um, we're affirming. We're making sure that we're being accurate in our expressions of empathy. And we are um, uh, making uh, expressing autonomy. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. People are not able to hear. Are most people able to hear? I'm going to just assume so. OK. All right. And then compassion is seeking to alleviate the suffering of others. And evocation is what we do when we put forth our curiosity, when we say, I don't know what your dials and levers of change are going to be. I, I really am curious, and I want to help figure that out. So Anne and I are going to uh, read a couple of sentences. And what I want you to do is I want you to tell me whether this is or isn't the spirit of MI. So um, Anne, if you could go ahead and uh, read your part of the dialogue, we'll see what people think about that. OK. Um, I really would like to become a non-smoker. It's a hassle having to go outside to smoke at work. But you know, over the years, the people I work with that smoke, we've be they've become some of my closest friends. I would miss talking to them as we shiver and shake our way through those cold winter months. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to help Anne, and I'm going to say, have you thought about who you could hang out with instead? Do you have any other friends at work? I bet you could make other friends. I mean, you seem pretty nice to me. What do you guys think? <laughs> No, I didn't fool a one of you with that one. Yeah, mm -mm. yeah. People are typing no as fast as they can. Huh? <laughs> yep. I'd have to agree. And why don't you read it again? And I'm going to try again and see if I can if I can uh, use the spirit of MI a little bit better. I I clearly missed the boat. Okay. So why don't you read the patient statement again? That same one. Sure. I really would like to be a non-smoker. It's a hassle to have to go outside and smoke at work. But you know, over the years, the people I work with have become some of my closest friends, or the people I smoke with have become some of my closest friends. I really miss talking to them as we shiver and shake our way through the cold winter months. Hmm. So if you could figure out a way how to maintain your important relationships, you'd really like to be a non-smoker. What do you think? Oh, they, they like that one a lot better, Anne. What do you think, Anne? Do you think that one would work better for the person? I think that does work better, yes. Yeah, all right. OK. All right. So um, actually, that was a complex reflection, just so that you all know. So the because I introduced the uh, concept of important relationships, and it's uh, double-sided as well. So we count that one as complex, just, just for um, Clarification. OK, good. So Anne, why don't you read the next sentence, and I'm going to try again, see if I can uh, display the spirit of motivational leadership. OK. I don't know what to do here. I feel stuck. I don't want to live like this anymore, and I'm completely controlled by cigarettes. What do you think I should do? Well, how about hypnosis? I've got a friend who does hypnosis for smokers, and it's worked pretty well. It's not cheap, but I think it would work well for you. Hmm. No, they don't like that one, Anne. No, that's a big fat no. Yeah, it's a big no. Mm -mm. Okay. Um, well, Anne, how about if you read that patient statement again, and then we're going to okay. see what we can do about that. All right. I don't know what to do here. I feel stuck. I don't want to live like this anymore. I'm completely controlled by cigarettes. What do you think I should do? Hmm. Gosh, I tried, you know, by suggesting that thing about the hot hypnosis, and they didn't like that. So I'm wondering, how about if some of you give Anne a response? What do you think you could say to Anne that would sound like the spirit of motivational interviewing? She can read it again if you want her to. She says she doesn't know what to do. She's stuck. She doesn't want to live like this anymore. She's completely controlled by cigarettes, and she's wondering what you think she should do. Mm. 
Sounds like you want to quit. Sounds like you're re really ready to make a change. Let's see if we can fix, figure out something that will work for you. Asking permission to give some advice. Sounds like you want to quit smoking if you could find a way. Right. Feel out of control. You don't really know what to do. What would be different about your life if you quit? So an evocative open question. You've got some really good ideas. Double-sided, I hear you're stuck. So uh, when you do the double-sided, I hear that you're stuck, but really want to quit, you want to use the uh, conjunction and. So I hear that you're stuck and you really want to quit. Good, good work, you guys. Good, solid work. All right. And let's see if, how we can do for this next one. They clearly understand this. Let's see if I understand this. So okay. Read the next patient statement. All right. I need to come up with some sort of plan to quit smoking. I've tried a few things, but in the end, I just end up going right back to smoking after a few days. I can only go so long, and then something stressful happens, and bam, I'm back at it. Well... I do have some ideas for what you might do to make it last longer, but it's probably best if we start with what you think might work best. Hmm, what do you think? Is that good? Oh, I got a good, yes, yes. Okay, I got an okay. Okay, <laughs> better. All right. Oh, I, I seem to be catching on here a little bit, Anne. Um, <laughs> And then, Anne, why don't you read the last one? All right. Um, I've been told that if I don't quit smoking, I'm going to die. I don't want to die, but I've tried so many times. Yeah. Well, what have you already tried that didn't work? What do you think? Hmm. So I'm going to challenge you on this one, guys. If I ask Anne, smoker, smoker Anne, and she's playing the role of the smoking Anne, is Anne, if I were to say, if she says, I've been told that if I don't quit smoking, I'm going to die. I don't want to die, but I've tried so many times. And I ask Anne what things she's already tried that didn't work. It is indeed an open question, but what kind of talk am I going to get out of Anne? What is she going to What is she going to give me? Failure, negative, stock talk, sustain, negative self talk, not change talk. Yes, negative energy. Exactly. So while I was being evocative, I am very deliberately inviting Anne to tell me all of the things that didn't work, which is that likely to move Anne in the direction of change? Nope, 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 right, good work. All right, so it's a whole bunch of things going on in parallel process here, right? It's, it's the spirit of MI at the same time giving this person the best shot that they could possibly have at moving towards change. So let's see if we um, can practice at that a little bit. And so my actual, the good response to that would be, you don't want to die. I would use person first language and I would say, you don't want to die. And you could ask what has worked, yes. But I would, given the fact that Anne has really strong change talk in that statement, I would say, you don't want to die and have her as a simple reflection and have her continue to reinforce that. So good ideas in the chat box. Okay, so um, last week we started to visit our open-ended affirmation, reflection, and summary skills. We're gonna continue on with that now that we've done a review of the importance of the uh, spirit of motivational interviewing. So um, let's do a little reflective listening practice to get ourselves warmed up on that. I want to quit smoking. My kids would get off my back. I'd have more money, and maybe this hacking cough would go away. So what do we want to say? What is? Oh, this was your homework, wasn't it? Yes. So which one is it? I forgot I had given you homework. Whew, what was
We have two votes still in the poll. Which one is the best response to that? I'll go back just one here so you can see it. I want to quit smoking. My kids would get off my back. I'd have more money, and maybe this hacking cough would go away. So what's the best reflection you could give to that one? Okay. Well, it clearly, there's two responses that people are picking. They're picking the first one, they're picking A, and they're picking, a few people are picking D as well. So let's talk about what these are. Because remember, I think I mentioned the first time that one of the things that's so uh, powerful about motivational interviewing is, is that people who are good at motivational interviewing, people who have put in the time and really practice it, one of the things that they're able to do is they're able to add an intentionality to their speech and language, to their helping style, that they didn't usually have before they learned motivational interviewing. So if somebody's going along and they're doing motivational interviewing, you, you could presumably go up to them, put your hand on their shoulder and say, stop, why are you, could you just back up? Could you tell me why you just said what you said? And a good motivational interviewer will know why they said what they said because they're so cued into um, what the what the client or the patient is saying and then how they respond. So let's take a look at that this these responses with that kind of view with that what I say is is in response to this person and it's going to encourage the person to do more or less of what I want them to do. So if you say in response to I want to quit smoking. My kids would get off my back. I'd have more money, and maybe this hacking cough would go away. You want to quit smoking. That's what most people pick. They pick, you want to quit smoking. So what is that? What is the intentionality of that? Those of you who picked that, why did you pick, you want to quit smoking? That's the starting point. Mm -hmm. Affirmative change talk. Yep helping them realize it's a good starter. Reflect the goal of quitting. Yep. It's what they said, right? It's a simple reflection. The patient stated her goal of quitting first. Yes, it's really what the patient said, I want to quit smoking. It's a very powerful statement that the patient already said, all you have to do is say it back. The last one, D, Oh, well, let's go, uh, some people pick uh, C. Do you know how bad it will be if something happens to your kid? So how does that answer fit with motivational interviewing? How does that fit or not fit? You can give your argument either side. Do you know how bad it will be if your kid, if something happens to your kid? Yeah, so guilt grip. Oh, I like how you said that, guilt grip. Yeah, it's judgmental. So it's, it's, it implies guilt, it's not helpful, it's a scare tactic, yeah. It's, yeah, we just, and it's a closed question. There's, it's, it doesn't show listening, it's confrontational. And I like what you said, Susan, it, she already knows. Of course this woman knows how bad it will be. She's already actually said a little bit about that. And then the last one, you realize that what you're doing isn't smart and it's very dangerous. You're literally seeing how much smoking is hurting you. I, I disagree with that one too. What, what went into your decision to pick that or not pick that? How do you feel like that's fitting or not fitting with what you know about motivational interviewing? What you're doing isn't smart, it's insulting, it's inferring that the person isn't smart, it's affirming that they're dumb and reckless. Yeah, that's been all, yeah, all of the above, right, yeah. It just doesn't, it doesn't, it's too negative, doesn't fit with the response. Yeah. So the, I want to, we're trusting that the person is, is in charge of their own stuff, that they already know this stuff and that we don't need to reinforce it. Okay, we'll move off this one. So it's not you want to have more money. <laughs> it's that one. You want to quit smoking. Okay. I don't know why that's doing that. Okay. 
So here's the next one that you did for homework. Uh, I don't know about quitting smoking. I mean, I think I want to quit drinking, but the thought of quitting them both scares me to death. So would you say you don't know about quitting smoking? Thinking about giving up both drinking and smoking is scary. I think that you'll be most successful if you give up both. You don't want to quit smoking. What do you think is making it so hard? Okay, lots of votes in. So, well, let's see. Let's take these from the top. You don't know about quitting smoking. So, what, how does that answer fit? Why would we favor you don't know about quitting smoking? What is that going to get us? What would the person talk about next if we say that one? You don't know about quitting smoking. You don't know about quitting smoking. Because they said that. They did say that. If we reinforce that, which is what we do when we reflect something, it's what they said exactly. If we say that, what are they then going to be talking about next? Now, at least it says it misses the point. Yeah. They... Right. We're just reinforcing their stuck talk, encouraging sustain. Why are they? Yeah. Okay. Thinking about giving up both drinking and smoking is scary. Now, why? A lot of people pick that answer. And I agree with that one. Why? why did, what went into your decision to pick that one? It's what was said. <laughs> It affirms that they're scared. She's worried. It's empathy. Yes, Richland County, it's empathy. It is indeed empathy. It is, it is just validating, affirming, reveals the ambivalence, letting them know you heard them. Yes, yes, it gives you a good place to start by talking about their fears. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just a statement of empathy. Yeah, nicely done. Okay, so I would pick thinking about giving up both drinking and smoking is scary. Yep. And I don't know why that's doing that. Okay. I clearly need to. Okay. All right. So we are going to move on from our reflection um, examples from last week. And we're going to do a little bit of uh, sprucing up on our skill of affirmation. So affirmations, just a couple of basics on affirmations are this. They are not evaluative. They are descriptive. You're definitely not patronizing people. They don't come from a place of I. It's not what you prefer, like, or compliments this person. What The reason that we stay away from the I is because we don't want to create hierarchies in our relationships. So if I say to somebody, I'm proud of you, I think that's great, that's wonderful, I am automatically assuming that my judgment of their behavior is somehow important to this person. So what an affirmation does is they come instead from a place of genuine, true, positive regard from this person. They show that I see you as a person who has absolute worth. So they're very different from compliments. So what we're going to do is we're going to practice with this a little bit. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to read about Jennifer here, or I'll actually I'll read this. After I finish reading it, I want you to just chat, put into the chat box, things that you notice about Jennifer that she's got going for her, okay? Like things that, that Jennifer has like in her, like, okay, these are accomplishments, values, achievements that Jennifer has going for her, okay? So Jennifer is a 27-year-old person who has been smoking for 10 years. Recently, she was picked up for her second OWI, 
and she's decided that some inpatient treatment might be helpful to her. She's tired of living like this. She stated that she's told her employer that she'll be out on leave for a month. He expressed that he was rooting for her. She's also got someone to take care of her dog, Smudge. She's pretty nervous, but she knows that OWI, not knowing where she's going to wake up, or even thinking about calling in hungover, isn't the life she wants. So we've got, she has support from her employer, she's self-motivated to seek treatment, she wants help, she's recognizing she's tired of this. We are talking, at this point, we're just talking about good question, Elizabeth, we're talking about alcohol and smoking. She's, she's going to have to stop smoking in order to get into treatment. Yes, DUI and OWI are the same thing, operating while intoxicated, driving under the influence. She identified she needed help, she sounds like she's ready, she's taken some positive steps. Yep, made the choice to seek treatment. She's got employer health support. Yes, I'm rooting for her too. Yeah, okay. So let's take those things in turn. So one of the things is, so you guys said she's voluntarily going to treatment. Look at, I guess the things you were gonna say. She's employed, she has a good relationship with her employer, she cares for her pets, she cares about her own personal safety, okay? Those are some things that we can all sort of agree that Jennifer has going for her, right? So now, let's take those things. So when you voluntarily go about, uh, voluntarily go to treatment, she, it shows that she cares about herself, right? That she's not afraid to try to make things better and that she has some awareness of herself. That the fact that she's going to treatment shows that she has those things, right? So in order to point that out to her, we could say the fact that you're willing to go to treatment shows that you've been thinking hard about this. So think of how different that sounds than if we were to take this, this look at, at Jennifer here and we were to say something to Jennifer like, hey, Jennifer, I think it is so cool that you're ready to go to treatment and that, you know, like you just, you just see like how things have gotten and you just, you really don't like that. And, and I just think that's amazing that you come to that. Eh. Who is that about if I say it like that? I think that's amazing. You're a rock star. That's wonderful. Me. Right. Exactly. It's about me, not her. So if instead we do this one here, the fact that you're willing to go to treatment shows that you've been thinking hard about this. That's something specific to Jennifer that she can take home with her. She's like, yeah, I know how to think about things. I, I, I'm working hard at this, and it's about me, not her me, Jennifer, not, not the helper, exactly. Okay, so now let's look at the fact that she's employed and has a good relationship with her employer. What do people who are employed and have good relationships with their employers, what does that show? What does that show about her? The fact that she's employed, what attributes do employed people who have good relationships, she can stick with things, she's a good employee, she's reliable, she has a work ethic, she's dedicated. Responsible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, integrity, commitment. Good. Yes, values by her. Yes, exactly. So let's see what we could do here with that. So responsible, hardworking, dependable, personable. Yes, all those things. So what could we say to her to let her know that we think that the fact that she's employed and has a good relationship with her employer to kind of build her confidence and make her see that she's got some things, we could say this, your work is important to you and you don't want to mess it up. Or your boss values you and wants to see you feeling better, right? So that's showing her that she's got these things, that they are about her, not about my, uh, my um, valuation of her. All right. All right, so that's that on affirmations. What questions do you have about affirmations? They're a little bit tricky. Anything? I can tell that people want to ask a question. It's a bit hard to think of these things on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's okay to to that going into treatment shows you're committed to change. Sure. Are your 
I would say that you're you're willing to entertain the possibility of change. Mm hmm Yep. Okay. So let me just go back to the basics. Somebody just wanted to see that quick. Let me just so the basics of affirmations are they're not evaluative, they're descriptions. So remember when we did them with Jennifer, we were saying like this is where I'm giving these words to you or I'm recognizing these things in you because of this. Um, the not um, patronizing. So I'm, I'm not saying like, good girl, you're great, that's wonderful. Those things are patronizing and put me again in that position above the person. Like I get to judge your behavior. We don't come from a place of I. It's not about what I like, what I think is great. It's, a, it's things, um, characteristics, attributes, values that, are the, that this person possesses. So they're genuine and true, they're very different from compliment. Yep, it, it's good to, yeah, stay away from the I statement. So anyway, so yeah, just think about how affirmations could work for you in your work and definitely, uh, continue to do some investigating on how they could, on, on them and um, how they might work. I'm gonna, I could actually, um, after this webinar, I could post a little cheat sheet that has some things on it about like, here are the cheats for open questions, here are some cheats for affirmations, for reflections, and for summarization. So if Veronica and Anne help me try to remember that, I will post something on the, our website. And yes, it's a nice cheat sheet, people. It's the ORS cheat sheet. So I will, yep, I will make sure to get that. Okay, so let's talk now about the O skill. So last time we focused all of our time talking about the R skill, the reflection. Now we've got an A, we put the A skill there, but now we're gonna talk about the O skill, which is open-ended questions. So again, just a couple of reminders, open-ended questions are questions that require more of a yes or no response, require more than a yes or no, they're gonna get people more invested in the conversation. So they really encourage a sense of engagement or a sense of this person, like of course this person has more to say than just yes, no. If all I'm doing is asking yes or no questions, I'm basically giving the impression that I will ask the questions and you will answer them and I will decide what's important. That is not what open-ended questions do. Open-ended questions show our sense of curiosity, our sense of that the evocative curiosity much more than a closed question. This is not to say that all closed questions are evil incarnate and you should never ask them. That is not what I'm saying, but I do want to emphasize the importance of mostly relying on open-ended questions. So questions that start with what, how, tell me about, describe, say more, in what ways, those are considered open-ended question starters. We fully recognize that tell me about, describe, in what ways, say more, do not end with a um, question mark, but we still consider them open-ended questions, okay? They're still called a question. So here are some open-ended or open-minded questions that a person might ask at hello. So what brings you here today? Tell me how things have been going. Describe what's going on. How have you been? What's up? Right, all of those are open-ended questions that you might say when you just first meet someone. So let's do some practice with these questions. So um, are you in a relationship? Is that an open-ended question? Nope, make it open. Make are you in a relationship an open question. Tell me about your relationship. Tell me about your relationship. What's your relationship status? Relationship status, tell me about your relationship. Okay, so that's, when I'm teaching face-to-face, -face, that's the common, uh, many of the common responses that I get. How long have you been in a relationship is also closed. What can you tell me about your relationship? Okay, so as helpers, why would you even be asking that question? Why would you ask, a uh, consumer, customer, client, why would you ask them if they're in a relationship? What, what would be your intent? Why would you? Yes, Samantha, tell me about the support you have, support system, to find out what support system, right. So all of that, what you really wanna know is if they have a support system. So this question here, are you in a relationship? The reason that it's there is to challenge you to think about 
am I asking for the thing that I really want? So if you want to know who their peeps are, who their supports are, then ask that. If you're asking, are you in a relationship? First of all, you, don't, you have no idea. I, I don't know what the person sitting across from me, what their, what a relationship means to them. And so if you were to, so saying, who are your people? Who supports you? Who do you get your stuff from? That, if that's what you really want to know, that's what you want to put in your open-ended question. So that was there as a deliberate challenge to our evocative thinking. Are you feeling sad about losing your job? Clearly that's also a closed question. How could we bring in more open-mindedness, more open-endedness? Tell me what you're feeling about your job status. Yes, rather than just assuming that they're feeling sad. How are you feeling? Tell me how you feel. Tell me about your recent job situation. How are you feeling about losing your job? Yes, nice, good work. Can you tell me about your children? Is that question, oh, I'll just say it, it's closed. What would you, would you how would you uh, replace that one? Can you tell me about your children? What's up with your kids? Tell me about your children. Tell me about your children. Tell me about your children. Tell me more about your kids. Yes. Next one. How often are you smoking? That's closed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Tell me about your smoking. Here's the deal. <laughs> We might want to know how often somebody's smoking, especially if we're doing some kind of a risk reduction thing. But when we're doing motivational interviewing, we're really trying to stay away from those fact-finding questions. So hopefully, if we, if we really need to do that for some kind of assessment purpose, we've done that in our assessment part, not in our motivational interviewing part. But either way, so if we do find ourselves and we want to ask that when we're kind of in the midst of trying to help this person change their behavior, you want to do, Robin's got a good example here, describe your smoking for me. Or would you mind sharing more about your smoking? Or what are you thinking about smoking? What do you notice that you're smoking? That stuff is going to give you much more of the complete picture. Given that for open-ended questions or any question, we're trying to minimize the number of questions that we ask. We're really trying to get to the point where we have almost like two or more reflections per question. So when we ask a question, we want it to really count. So the bigger the question, the, the bigger you make that question, the fewer questions you're going to have to ask. So how often are you smoking is only going to get you how often are you smoking, and then you're going to have to ask 15 follow-up questions to that. And then finally, did you think that he was going to help you fix it? What do you think about that question? What kind of help were you expecting? Who is he? I don't know who he is. He's awful. Yeah, <laughs> it could be critical. <laughs> Judgmental. Yeah, yeah, this is not a good question at all. Yeah, very pointed and yeah. Okay, we'll move on from that. Okay, so one of the functions that open questions serve is they help us um, they help us elicit change talk so when we're getting change talk when it just is happening when change talk is just free flowing from the person we can use our or skills to reinforce it so we can say say more about that we can affirm something we heard we could reflect their change talk we definitely want to include it in our summaries but when change talk isn't just happening we want to use um, open-ended questions that elicit more so here's an example of a, an open-ended question that gets the person to give us more change talk so um, and can you read the person the patient statement and I'll read the helper of course. Um, I love having a smoke first thing in the morning. When I get up in the morning, I just can't think until I've had a smoke. I'd like to have more cash, but whatever. So say more about having more cash. So do you see by asking Anne, say more about having more cash, what would she likely say next? Hearing about her inner motivation. Yes. 
he's going to be making the argument for why having more cash in her life is important to her. I don't know why it's more important to her. I'm genuinely curious. I don't know what she'll do with that cash. I don't like I'm being very open and asking her why she'd like to have more cash. All right, let's go to the next one here. So those questions for eliciting change talk can fall under a couple of different categories. So when we, did we, no, we didn't talk about this last week. Did we talk about change talk specifics, desire? Oops, sorry, I'm not actually pointing. Did we talk about desire, ability, reason, and need? No, okay, so let me back up for a second here. So before we talk about the questions for listening change talk, I just wanna spend a minute here talking about the different kinds of change talk. So definitely we've been talking and talking and talking on here about how important it is for us to um, build up a big pile of change talk, how what we really, really wanna do is get people talking about change. Well, we know from the research of um, Paul Amrine in 2002 that change talk tends to fall in some pretty specific categories. And, and you don't necessarily have to be able to in the moment hear these different categories, but what we find is that it helps people um, do better with hearing change talk if they have a good understanding of kind of what it sounds like, right? You have to know what it sounds like in order to do something with it. So change talk falls under, under these four um, headers, desire, ability, reason, and need. Desire, ability, reason, and need. So desire talk, people say that when they want, when they want something, desire something, or wish it. They might talk about what they can or could do. Oh, Paul Amrine, 2002. It's really boring research, but go right ahead and read it. <laughs> He's a psycholinguist. So it's really complicated stuff, but he did some really cool research that really moved the field of motivational interviewing along. And then uh, the reason is the R, and the need is uh, questions about need, ought to, should have, gotta. Okay? So change talk desire. If we want to ask somebody to specifically give us change talk about what they desire, we would ask them questions like this. What do you want? What do you wish would be different? Or what do you hope for? Okay, all of that, I don't know why that one's missing, but all of those get at people expressing their desires for, different, for this change. If we want ability talk, we use the words that are, are implied with ability, like can and could, right? So what could you do? What can you do? If you did decide to change, what about you would make it possible? So again, I, if I want somebody to talk about their specific abilities, I ask them about it. They might volunteer it. If they just volunteer it, great. I'm gonna reinforce it with my or skills. But if they're not giving me any talk about what they can or could do, I might ask questions like this. If I want to know what their particular reasons are for doing something, I'm going to ask questions specific to reason. What are your reasons for wanting to change? Or what would be two or three reasons that you want might change? Now, in this previous example, you notice I have this hypothetical here. If you did decide to change, what about you would make it possible? So I want you to think about how that could work in all of these. If you did decide you wanted to change, if you did decide you wanted to do something about this, if, if quitting smoking was something you felt like you could maybe do, what reasons would you wanna do it? Or what would be two or three reasons that you might wanna do it? So when you put that hypothetical at the beginning of any change talk question, it softens it a little bit. It softens the implication that this person is for sure gonna do it. So if you feel like somebody's still got a lot of sustained talk, you might use that hypothetical stuff, okay? Then if you want need, if you want people to talk about what they need to, you're gonna ask them about it. What do you need to do? What do you feel like you should do? What do you feel like you ought to do? All those questions get at a person's uh, need. And then, oops, okay. 
Then, okay, so questions about using the darn questions. What questions do you have? So if you want questions that get at desirability, reason, or need, you ask for it. You ask for desire, question, desire, ability, reason, or need responses. So what questions do you have about those? It's a great use of open questions. Nothing? Okay. So oh. one thing I do want to point out, because as you're thinking like, oh my goodness, this style of communication has ORs, and I have to remember what ORs stands for, and then there's all these this darn, we've got darn, and we've got darn cat, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Like, oh my gosh, there is so, the pace, yes. There are so many mnemonics, how on earth am I supposed to um, remember all of these things, okay? So here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about two things. I want you to think about importance and confidence. So in order for people to make changes, they have to see the changes important. And they have to feel that they that they have to have some confidence, that they, they have to have some hope and confidence that they have some of what it takes to make this change, okay? So if you look at these desire questions, and, you, and, and sometimes it helps to think of importance and confidence as buckets. So and imagine a bucket labeled important. Imagine a bucket labeled confidence. So as the person expresses stuff about what they want or what they wish could be different or what they hope, right, does that help fill up their importance bucket or their confidence bucket? They're filling these buckets themselves. Does it fill their import importance? Exactly, importance bucket. Okay, now take a look at the ability question. Do the ability, when people start saying, saying things about so if you were to ask them what they can do or what they could do or if they decided to change, what would make it possible? If they're doing that, does that, yes, it fills their confidence bucket, doesn't it? So either they volunteer it or you ask them these change talk questions and you get them talking out loud about what they can or could do, that's helping fill that, that confidence bucket. Now let's look at, at reasons. When they give their individual reasons for making changes, is that filling their confidence bucket or their importance bucket? Does it, does it, which one does it fill? Important. Yep. It fills their importance bucket. So now this person has their needs in there. They might have some reasons in there. Their importance bucket is getting, is getting all filled up because they need big, filled up buckets in order to go out into the big wide world and make these changes. Now finally, the last one is need. When people talk about what they need to, should, oughta, does that feel importance or confidence? Importance, yep. So in essence, rather than thinking about, oh my gosh, the desirability, reason, need, oh my gosh, all this stuff, you're thinking, I have this person in front of me, and what I want to equip them with is what I want to facilitate, not equip them with, sorry, Ooh, take that back. Um, what I want to fill them, what I want them to see is that they have their own stuff in their importance bucket. And what I did is I helped draw up out of their well the stuff, reminded them, helped them see, look, you've got all these reasons why this thing is important to you. This is all your stuff. And then I helped you fill up your confidence bucket, your confidence bucket, right? Like these are successes, these are things you've done in the past. These are things you have going for you. These are the things that are important to you. All of that stuff helps build their confidence bucket. So that when they leave your office, they're leaving with two full buckets. So think about this. Think about adults who smoke. Think about the average adult smoker, whether it's you or someone you know, think about the average adult smoker. Does the average adult smoker have a, how is their importance bucket? Is it usually pretty full or pretty empty? I'll just give you two answers. Is it full or empty? 
their, their importance bucket. Is it full or empty? Very full. Yes, the average adult smoker has a very full importance bucket. Now, the average adult smoker, what about their confidence bucket? How would you describe that? Low, lacking, low, empty. Yes, because the average adult smoker has tried to quit six or seven times, right? So their bucket, their confidence bucket, yes, hole in the bottom, tends to be really empty. So for the adult smoker, you might work more, you might have more concentration on talking about their abilities and things that can help them in terms of building their confidence than needing to fill their talk about desire, reason, and need, because that's usually pretty right there. But now let's switch it. Let's think about, act, about um, teenage smokers. So uh, how would you describe a teenage smoker's bucket in terms of importance to quit smoking? Where do, where do you think their, their uh, yeah, yes, 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 good point, yes. Yeah, completely empty. Yeah, they don't, they don't see any reason to quit smoking. There's no desire, there's no reason, there's no need to quit smoking, right? Oblivious, yeah. Now, if they did decide that they wanted to quit smoking, how confident are they that they would be able to do so? That average teenager, who's a smoking teenager. Super confident, really confident, very confident, extremely high confidence, right? Because that's how they're wired right? They think they can do whatever they want. Exactly. That's how they're wired. That's how we have them set. I mean, that's like biologically the way that they're supposed to think, right? Because they have to push away from us. It's a really important developmental period in their lives. And so their confidence tends to be really high. So you might not work on confidence with, a, with an adolescent smoker, whereas you work on that. That would be the specific intervention you might use with an adult smoker. All right. So I want to give you some other kinds of change talk questions, some other kind of open questions that help us get at people's change. So help us be evocative and curious about their change, some different ways to ask about change. So this strategy is called using extremes. So what we do here is we ask, we imagine kind of, we ask the person about the worst and best case scenarios. So yeah, what's the worst thing that can happen? What concerns you the most? What do you hope for the most? What would be a perfect outcome? What would that look like? So that's taking things to the nth degree, right? Like what would be, if, you, if things continue on the way they are right now, what's the worst thing that could happen? Or let's say you were able to change this. What's the best thing that could happen? So that's one way. That's another strategy for getting people to think about change. We don't know why this is doing that, sorry. The another strategy is looking back. So specifically asking people, do you remember a time when things were going well? What's changed? Or what did you envision for your life when you were young? So thinking back to how they had different visions for their life and getting people to talk about that, that can often be a strategy. That's a strategy for eliciting change talk. Another one is looking forward. If nothing changes, what do you see happening in five years? If you did decide to change, what would that look like? How would you like for things to work turn out? So this looking forward is a lot like the, um, those of you who do solution focus, this is kind of like the miracle question, isn't it? Do you see some similarities there? Yeah. Okay. So I don't know about this underlining. Sorry, guys. Okay. Then another strategy for listening change talk, the last one I want to talk about is exploring goals and values. So the thinking here is, is that when you ask people specifically to think about, to spend some time to create a climate where they can think about the things that are most important to them, then what happens is, is that you help them put up the thing that they're thinking about changing next to the things that are really important to them. So what things do you regard as most important? So, oh, my kids are really important. My job is really important. It's important for me to stay out of legal trouble, and it's important for me to save money. And then, so maybe even writing those things down, and then asking the person in a very truly curious, evocative way, so how does your smoking help or hinder 
your what's important to you like is it getting in the way or is it somehow helping you achieve that goal and that systematic kind of going down like these are the things that are important and then how does this fit and being genuinely like okay if they say well it really helps me like I, I, my friends are really important and i have to smoke in order to fit in with them okay are there other areas where it's getting in the way and then another way to explore their goals is what sort of things would you like to accomplish in your life so just again things where people are able to kind of think about this is where i am versus this is where i want to be and what is the tension between those two things is there tension between the way i'm acting and the way things are going and what i really want out of life all right so then we talked about how important it is to fill the confidence bucket so one thing that you might want to do is you might want to assess whether the confidence where the confidence bucket is right like how do you know how full their confidence bucket is and so one way to do that is to ask them so you could ask this on a scale of zero to ten with zero being not at all and ten being super confident how confident are you that you could quit smoking now the answer to that is not the most important part so let's say they say six well what does six mean how how would we possibly know what six means to another person and could one person's six be another person's three be another person's nine absolutely so the follow-up questions are what's most important and so the follow-up questions to the scale are this what led you to choose a six rather than a four and we want to go down a little bit so when we go down when you say what led you to choose a six rather than a four and they answer what kind of talk is going to come out of their mouth it is a great question isn't it <laughs> change change talk exactly change talk so well i picked a six because I really do think I do have some confidence. You know, I've done this before and I've made other behavior changes and I blah, 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 blah. Maybe I'm even a seven, right? The other thing that you could do is you, another follow-up question that you can ask is this. What would it take for you to move from a six to a seven or an eight? And that, what kind of talk is that going to get you? What's that going to help you with? If you say, what would it take for you to move from a six to an eight? Commitment, problem solving, yes. Yep, motivation, yeah. A lot of times it gets you the stuff that helps you that you're like, oh, I actually know we have a resource for that, or there's a medication for that, or there's something we could do that I could help with that. Because you're good resource managers, so oftentimes you know what the, you have access to the thing that it would take to move them from an X to an X. Good. So likewise, in addition to, to scaling confidence, we can scale important and so we do the same thing on a scale of zero to ten zero being not at all ten being super important how important is it for you to quit smoking so again both of these questions whether you ask the confidence question or the important question give you a sense of where you need to focus your efforts if i want this person to have both importance and confidence to leave my office with or i at some point maybe after three conversations we've got both of those buckets full then I want to know kind of where they're at. And again, I'm going to ask that what led you to choose an X rather than an X? What would it take to move you from an X? The other thing that you can do, and I didn't have this on the confidence slide either, is to just ask them what that means. Well, what 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 does a six mean to you? What what does a six mean? And they'll tell you what it means. I am so sorry about this weird underlining, guys. I have no idea why that's happening. All right. So one of the last concepts I want to talk about today is discordance. And discordance is a funny animal. It sounds very different. It doesn't sound like change, and it doesn't sound like sustain. It sounds like discord. And so sometimes what we're going to hear from people is we're going to hear these statements that start with you. And I'm wondering, in your work, what kind of things you've heard from the people you work with that start with you and i'll just give you a little bit of motivation here like things like you people 
you always, you, what kind of things do you hear like that? You think you know everything? You think it's easy? You're trying to make me? You know best, and I imagine that's in a snarky way, Sarah. The therapist thinks this stuff is so easy. You don't understand what it's like. You're impossible. You don't understand. Yep, all of those. Yep. So here are some examples. Who are you to tell me what to do? What do you know? You don't even have any children. Have you ever smoked pot? Do you even know how hard it is to quit? You people are just here for the paycheck, right? You just want to tell me what to do. You don't understand. You're impossible. All that stuff. Okay. So if you were to look in the first two editions of the textbook, you would see that what the word that was used to describe people saying stuff like this was resistance. And when they wrote the third edition of the textbook, they decided, made the good decision to say, you know what, if we say this is resistance, that doesn't help our practitioners, our well-meaning practitioners. It doesn't cue them to do some, the, the, the most helpful thing. Because when you look at the other person as resistant, you're sort of saying, this is a, a trait that this person has. When in reality, what really is creating the the tension when people say stuff like this, like, who are you to tell me what to do? What do you want? What do you know? You don't even have any children. This is easy for you to say. You're impossible. You therapists think this stuff is easy. When they're saying stuff like that to you, it's not that they're that they have a trait of being resistant. It's that they're signaling to you that you're going too fast, too far, or they don't feel like their opinion, their feelings are being accounted for. And so we don't want to think like, oh, this is just a trait this person has. Instead, we want to consider it a, a state in our relationship. That it's a signal to me, oh, engagement. Oh, 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 engagement isn't going so well. And so what I need to do is I need to tend to it. I need to make sure that this person feels heard and understood and feels like and is reminded that they get to have a lot of say in how things go. Okay? So let's take a look at these. All right. So when somebody says, who are you to tell me what to do, what they're really saying is, I'd like to have some control in this. Right? If we put our empathy hat on, that's what they're really saying. What if a person says, what do you know? You don't even have any children. They're saying, I don't know if you can help me because I don't think you understand what it's like to live my life, right? I'm, I'm kind of doubting that you're even going to be able to help me, right? Or when they say, have you ever smoked pot? They're thinking, like, you, if you haven't smoked pot, I bet you don't know how hard it is to quit and you don't understand. Or they might say, um, you people are just here for the paycheck. And what they're really saying is, I want someone to care about me. All right. So if somebody, if, if what the person says is, who are you to tell me what to do, and what they're really saying is, I want to have some control in this, how could we reflect that? If we imagine that although the words coming out of their mouth are, who are you to tell me what to do, we say, you know, with my empathy hat on, I bet what they're thinking is they want to have some control in this, how could I reflect that? You want, you want control of how to do this. You're wondering if I can really help you. Mm -hmm. You want to have some control. Yes. Yeah. So even though you're feeling like, for God's sakes, I'm not telling you what to do, why would you even think that? I'm telling you what to do. I'm not telling you what to do. When we do that, 
we are essentially creating more tension, right? We're arguing with them. This isn't about who's right or who's wrong or all that. It's, it's, it's just saying in this moment, this is your perspective and I'm meeting you where you're at. So yeah, you wanna make your own decisions. You're the expert on you. You wanna feel heard. Yes, you wanna, yes, very good. Okay, now let's try the next one. I think we'll probably have an, yeah. You wanna have some say in how this goes for you. Okay, the next one. What do you know? You don't even have any children. And if they're basically trying to convey to you that they want you to understand what it's like to live their life with, I don't know, six kids under the age of two, what would you say back to be empathic? To reflect that by reflecting this we're going to hopefully let this discord kind of melt away what do you know you don't even have any children you wonder if it's if I really understand what it's like to be you Okay, so we don't want to we don't want to um, we don't want to tell them that it's different. So we don't want to say like, I do know I I also have six children under the age of six. Like we don't that's not what they're saying. They're not saying you don't want to start arguing with them because their perception is that you're not understanding them in that moment. So we don't want to we don't want to either reinforce that that that's the right thing to think or argue that it's not, okay? So, and then I also see a lot of you using open questions in response to that. And that's a really also a very common thing in face-to-face -face workshops. So here's what I'm gonna challenge you on. So if a person says to you, what do you know? You don't even have any children and you are their helper, okay? And you say, you're right, I, I don't have any children or, or I do, whatever you say tell me more about it or tell me more about your life. When you do that, you have just reinforced to this person that you don't understand. So, and you're their helper. So that might be a little bit scary, right? So again, you don't want to say things. You don't want to say like, you're right, I don't understand you. I can't even imagine how bad that must be. Like, that's not helpful to people nor do you want to argue that you do have the same experience because you don't. We never have the exact same experience as someone. So really, what you really want to do rather than asking a question or saying, tell me more, because they just told you something, is you just want to reflect their experience in the moment. So here, Janice got one I can read that here. You have a lot of demands on your time or you're not sure that I can help you. You're worried that I don't understand your perspective. You don't know me well enough to trust me. Yes, all of those work. Yes. That's what the person is trying to tell you, and you took the time to reflect it. Let's do one. Okay. Yeah. So having kids makes life hard. Yep. Oop. I just gave you the answer to that one. So the next one. Um, have you ever smoked pot? And the person's wondering if you haven't smoked, how hard you, that you don't understand how hard it is. So here, the practitioner response I gave was, you want someone to understand what it's like for you. This is this is really hard, and you want someone to get it. And I'll just do the last one too. You people are just here for the paycheck. And they're, that's probably the person is telling you they're not really feeling very cared about. And you just say, it seems like I'm not really caring about you. Or you want me to step up my game so that you feel cared about. Again, you're not saying that you are or aren't doing that thing. You're acknowledging that in the moment, this is their perspective. And that's what empathy is really about. All right. Oh, just, this is just uh, one last tiny little sneak in thing here. I forgot about this. Um, you know, I keep talking about not telling people things, not like solving their problems, all that stuff. I did want to just, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't say, you know, sometimes you do have information that people really need. And so if you do find yourself in a situation where you want to give people some information, you want to do it in an am I adherent way. And what you do there is you do use the strategy that we call explore, offer, explore. And what we do there is we just say, what do you already know about this? What do you know? What what do you know about this? Are you interested in this? Is this something that makes sense to you that you want to hear more about? And then you want to ask for permission. Is it okay if I tell you a little bit more about it? So 
um, you know, what do you already know about uh, quitting smoking? Or what do you already know about how the laws in Minnesota have changed in treatment centers uh, regarding smoking? Or what do you already know about blah, blah, blah? Um, discord, Chris, the, the late resistance label became discord. Okay, so then for offer, um, then you offer your part. You get to tell them all the good stuff you know about this thing, right? So find out what they know first, ask them if it's okay if you fill in, then you get to give them all your information, all your information. Like you have asked permission and you have it, okay? Then the part that people tend to forget is this final explore. And what this final explore does is it, um, this final explore, I can't grab the pointer. <laughs> this final explore, um, ask them what they think about it. So you, what did you think about that? What surprised you about that? What might you do differently? Where does this leave us? So what do you already know about something is explore first. What do you already know? I'm not, you're not a Dumbo that just dropped onto the planet Earth yesterday. So what do you already know? Can I tell you more about this? Here we go. Here's what I know about it, right? I'm going to give the information in small bits and uh, digestible things. I might give you a menu of options, a number of things that you can do, or blah, 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 rather than just giving it as, you have to do this, right? You want to give them a couple of different options. And then most importantly, ask them what they thought about it. How are they digesting this information? What are their thoughts? Where do they see this leaving them? What questions do they have? All right. Whew. What questions do you have in our remaining time here? We did a lot. That was a flyby <laughs> motivational interviewing. Yes, it is the same as Alyssa Provide Alyssa. I actually usually use Alyssa Provide Alyssa, Alyssa, but this slide said elicit or offer elicit. So yeah, they're the same. Yes, it was a lot of information. Yeah, now just go out and do this, okay? You have an example of the fine. Um, a good book for a quick read reference would be the, um, uh, I would use the Rosengrin workbook. So David Rosengrin wrote a workbook called MI Skills, Helping Practitioners Learn Skills, something like that. It's the only one that has workbook in the title. And his name is David Rosengrin, MI Workbook. And you want to get the second edition. OK? Um, that is just a little bit of reading. And then like five to seven exercises practicing that concept. OK? So it's here's a little bit of reading. And then there's a whole bunch of practice. And then after the practice are all of the answers. So you know if you're on the right track. So that's a really good way to read. Uh, to, um, Learn motivational learning. The other thing that's good is the, the new textbook, the third edition of the textbook that came out in 2013, written by Drs. Um, William Miller and Stephen Wolnick, is a really, really good book as well. The first two editions were a little bit harder to digest, and I think the third edition reads kind of a little bit like a novel because they've got a lot of stories in there, um, a lot of that stuff. So that's always good. Which book do you have, Joan? Do you have the workbook or the textbook? Yeah. So the textbook is, this is the textbook. Oh, I do have a picture of this. OK, so this, Veronica, can you point to the textbook? <laughs> Thank you. That's the workbook. That's the workbook. And the textbook is the one right next to it. Yeah. There's also some specialized texts, the motivational interviewing in healthcare, motivational interviewing in diabetes care, nutrition and fitness. For those of you who do um, groups, the MI and groups book is really good. The social work practice one is good. <laughs> yes. Yes. Follow through during, oh, you followed along in the, during the presentation. All right. Well, good. I'm glad I was able to. Yeah, who are the authors of the third edition the same? The authors of the third edition I see that it's covered are the same as the other two editions. It's Miller and Rolnick. Yeah. Yeah. 
other questions. So um, also on this slide where it says Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, the www.motivationalinterviewing.org, that is the Mint trainer site, and that has a ton of really good resources that you can access um, even not being a member of the Mint. You get to, there's tons of stuff on there. So um, one thing that I will give you a caveat on is that there's a lot of uh, videos referenced on there. They reference a YouTube channel, um, and I think it says this specifically on there, but just to remind you that just because somebody put it on YouTube does not mean it's necessarily actually motivational interviewing, because as we all know, you can put anything you want on YouTube. So if you're watching something and, you know, like in these bad examples that I've been giving you, you're like, yeah, that's making my stomach hurt. I don't think that's good. Then it probably isn't, right? Stop watching it or watch it for how you would do things differently. But just because somebody says it's MI doesn't mean that it's actually MI. So be careful of that. What else can I help you with today? So if you want to keep your learning alive, continue to read. Find other people who are practicing motivational interviewing. Talk about motivational interviewing with them. Find somebody to listen to you practicing motivational interviewing, whether, they're, whether that is um, in person or they're listening to audio recording. Um, somehow to get some direct observation of your practice. That is the only way we know for people to really, really know what they're doing right and what they need to uh, fix up is to get some kind of feedback on your actual work with a client. Um, there, like I said, there's lots of things to read. There's videos. There's all kinds of stuff online. But if, uh, if you really want this to stay alive in your brain, what you need to do is you need to do something. You need to keep the learning alive. Otherwise, in about eight weeks, you'll have forgotten all about all of this. You'll have forgotten the difference between change talk and sustained talk and what does that really mean and all that stuff. Um, Joan has asked about an online consult group. That's something we could consider starting through the ATTC. Um, otherwise, I know that there are, you know, like when people take classes, sometimes they form little groups afterwards. Um, there should be some classes in your communities, in your areas. You can look for those. If you, actually, on that Mint website that I mentioned, the motivationalinterviewing.org, there's a calendar on there that will, um, that has all uh, different workshops on it, and so you could look for one in your area. Can this go beyond one-to-one -one relating to community coalitions? Yes, community coalitions should be thinking about how people actually change and change talk to groups. Yes, yes, Richland County. Any resources for group motivating? I would read the book. Uh, motivational interviewing in groups, and I have it. That is this Richland County, Wisconsin? I'm guessing that's on that's on here. If it is, I could loan you my MI book. Yeah, my MI and groups book. Just just back channel me, and we'll figure out, or I can give you some uh, excerpts from it. So good. Anything else? Yes, yes, because motivational learning is exploding in corrections. Yes, Derek. Good. Monthly work group. Yep. Good, good. All right. So that's what I had to share with you today. Um, I hope that you will continue with this if this is something that's going to make things easier for you and more effective for the people that you work with. Uh, that's all good reasons to keep using this. But again, you have to figure it out. For yourself how this is going to fit into your practice and how it fits with who you are and i will send you that cheat sheet no problem that's it fantastic laura thank you this is all really sure. good information um and again i just want to remind everybody we will have a recording of this webinar along with um the resources that Laura's talked about, we will put it on our website. It'll probably take us a couple of weeks to get it all up there, but um, keep checking back. And we really appreciate everybody being on. Thanks.